This is section 46 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835-1866. Chapter 46, Getting Settled in San Francisco. This was near the end of May, 1864. The intention of both Gillis and Clemens was to return to the States, but once in san francisco both presently accepted places clemens as reporter and gillis as compositor on the morning call from roughing it the reader gathers that mark twain now entered into a life of butterfly idleness on the strength of prospective riches to be derived from the half a trunkful of mining stocks and that presently when the mining bubble exploded he was a pauper but a good many liberties have been taken with the history of this period. Undoubtedly he expected opulent returns from his mining stocks, and was disappointed, particularly in an investment in Hale and Norcross shares, held too long for the large profit which could have been made by selling at the proper time. The fact is, he spent not more than a few days, a fortnight at most, in butterfly idleness at the lick house before he was hard at work on the call living modestly with steve gillis in the quietest place they could find never quiet enough but as far as possible from dogs and cats and chickens and pianos which seemed determined to make the mornings hideous when a weary night reporter and compositor wanted to rest they went out socially on occasion arrayed in considerable elegance but their recreations were more likely to consist of private midnight orgies, after the paper had gone to press, mild dissipations in whatever they could find to eat at that hour, with a few glasses of beer, and perhaps a game of billiards or pool in some all-night resort. A printer by the name of Ward, Little Ward they called him, L.P. Ward, well known as an athlete in san francisco he lost his mind and fatally shot himself in nineteen o three often went with them for these refreshments ward and gillis were both bantam gamecocks and sometimes would stir up trouble for the very joy of combat clemens never cared for that sort of thing and discouraged it but ward and gillis were for war they never assisted each other if one had offered to assist the other against some overgrown person it would have been an affront and a battle would have followed between that pair of little friends s l c nineteen o six steve gillis in particular was fond of incidental encounters a characteristic which would prove an important factor somewhat later in shaping mark twain's career of course the more strenuous nights were not frequent their home-going was usually tame enough and they were glad enough to get there clemens however was never quite ready for sleep then as ever he would prop himself up in bed light his pipe and lose himself in english or french history until sleep conquered his roommate did not approve of this habit it interfered with his own rest and with his fiendish tendency to mischief he found reprisal in his own fashion knowing his companion's highly organized nervous system he devised means of torture which would induce him to put out the light once he tied a nail to a string an arrangement which he kept on the floor behind the bed pretending to be asleep he would hold the end of the string and lift it gently up and down making a slight ticking sound on the floor maddening to a nervous man clemens would listen a moment and say what in the nation is that noise gillis pretended sleep and the ticking would continue clemens would sit up in bed fling aside his book and swear violently steve what is that damn noise he would say steve would pretend to rouse sleepily what, what, what's the matter sam what, what, what noise uh, oh i i guess that is one of those death ticks uh, they, they don't like the light uh, maybe it will stop in a minute it usually did stop about that time and the reading would be apt to continue 
but no sooner was there stillness than it began again tick 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 with a wild explosion of blasphemy the book would go across the floor and the light would disappear sometimes when he couldn't sleep he would dress and walk out in the street for an hour while the cruel steve slept like the criminal that he was at last one night he overdid the thing and was caught his tortured roommate at first reviled him then threatened to kill him finally put him to shame it was curious but they always loved each other those two there was never anything resembling an estrangement and to his last days mark twain never could speak of steve gillis without tenderness they moved a great many times in san francisco their most satisfactory residence was on a bluff on california street their windows looked down on a lot of chinese houses tin can houses they were called small wooden shanties covered with beaten-out cans steve and mark would look down on these houses waiting until all the chinamen were inside then one of them would grab an empty beer bottle throw it down on those tin can roofs and dodge behind the blinds the chinamen would swarm out and look up at the row of houses on the edge of the bluff shake their fists and pour out chinese vituperation by and by when they had retired and everything was quiet again their tormentors would throw another bottle this was their sunday amusement at a place on minna street they lived with a private family at first clemens was delighted just look at it steve he said what a nice quiet place not a thing to disturb us but next morning a dog began to howl gillis woke this time to find his roommate standing in the door that opened out into a back garden holding a big revolver his hand shaking with cold and excitement come here steve he said come here and kill him i'm so chilled through i can't get a bead on him sam said steve don't shoot him just swear at him you can easily kill him at that range with your profanity steve gillis declares that mark twain then let go such a scorching singeing blast that the brute's owner sold him next day for a mexican hairless dog we gather that they moved on an average about once a month a home letter of september twenty fifth eighteen sixty four says we have been here only four months yet we have changed our lodging five times we are very comfortably fixed where we are now and have no fault to find with the rooms or the people we are the only lodgers in a well-to-do private family but i need change and must move again this was the minna street place the place of the dog in the same letter he mentions having made a new arrangement with the call by which he is to receive twenty-five dollars a week with no more night work he says further that he has closed with the californian for weekly articles at twelve dollars each end of chapter forty six getting settled in san francisco read by john greenman this is section forty seven of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter forty seven bohemian days mark twain's position on the call was uncongenial from the start san francisco was a larger city than virginia the work there was necessarily more impersonal more a routine of news-gathering and drudgery he once set down his own memories of it at nine in the morning i had to be at the police court for an hour and make a brief history of the squabbles of the night before they were usually between irishmen and irishmen and chinamen and chinamen with now and then a squabble between 
the two races for a change during the rest of the day we raked the town from end to end gathering such material as we might wherewith to fill our required columns and if there were no fires to report we started some at night we visited the six theaters one after the other seven nights in the week we remained in each of those places five minutes got the merest passing glimpse of play and opera and with that for a text we wrote up those plays and operas as the phrase goes torturing our souls every night in the effort to find something to say about those performances which we had not said a couple of hundred times before it was fearful drudgery soulless drudgery and almost destitute of interest it was an awful slavery for a lazy man on the enterprise he had been free with a liberty that amounted to license he could write what he wished and was personally responsible to the readers on the call he was simply a part of a news machine restricted by a policy the whole a part of a still greater machine politics once he saw some butchers set their dogs on an unoffending chinaman a policeman looking on with amused interest he wrote an indignant article criticizing the city government and raking the police in virginia city this would have been a welcome delight in san francisco it did not appear at another time he found a policeman asleep on his beat going to a nearby vegetable stall he borrowed a large cabbage leaf came back and stood over the sleeper gently fanning him it would be wasted effort to make an item of this incident but he could publish it in his own fashion he stood there fanning the sleeping official until a large crowd collected when he thought it was large enough he went away the next day the joke was all over the city only one of the several severe articles he wrote criticizing officials and institutions seems to have appeared an attack on an undertaker whose establishment formed a branch of the coroner's office the management of this place one day refused information to a call reporter and the next morning its proprietor was terrified by a scathing denunciation of his firm it began those body snatchers and continued through half a column of such scorching strictures as only mark twain could devise the call's policy of suppression evidently did not include criticisms of deputy coroners such liberty however was too rare for mark twain and he lost interest he confessed afterward that he became indifferent and lazy and that george e barnes one of the publishers of the call at last allowed him an assistant he selected from the counting-room a big hulking youth by the name of mcglural with the acquired prefix of smiggy clemens had taken a fancy to smiggy mcglural on account of his name and size perhaps and smiggy devoted to his patron worked like a slave gathering news nights daytimes too if necessary all of which was demoralizing to a man who had small appetite for his place anyway it was only a question of time when smiggy alone would be sufficient for the job there were other and pleasanter things in san francisco the personal and literary associations were worthwhile at his right hand in the call office sat frank soul a gentle spirit a graceful versifier who believed himself a poet mark twain deferred to frank soul in those days he thought his verses exquisite in their workmanship a word of praise from soul gave him happiness in a luxurious office upstairs was another congenial spirit a gifted handsome fellow of twenty-four who was secretary of the mint and who presently became editor of a new literary weekly the californian which charles henry webb had founded this young man's name was francis bret hart originally from albany 
later a miner and schoolteacher on the Stanislaus, still later a compositor, finally a contributor on the Golden Era. His fame scarcely reached beyond San Francisco as yet, but among the little coterie of writing folk that clustered about the Era office his rank was high. Mark Twain fraternized with Bret Hart and the Era group generally. He felt that he had reached the land, or at least the borderland, of Bohemia, that Ultima Thule of every young literary dream. San Francisco did, in fact, have a very definite literary atmosphere and a literature of its own. Its coterie of writers had drifted from here and there, but they had merged themselves into a California body poetic, quite as individual as that of Cambridge, even if less famous, less fortunate in emoluments than the Boston group. Joseph E. Lawrence, familiarly known as Joe Lawrence, was editor of the Golden Era. The Golden Era, California's first literary publication, was founded by Roland M. Daggett and J. McDonough Foward in 1852, and his kindness and hospitality were accounted sufficient rewards even when his pecuniary acknowledgments were modest enough. He had a handsome office, and the literati, local and visiting, used to gather there. Names that would be well known later were included in that little band. Joaquin Miller recalls from an old diary, kept by him then, having seen Ada Isaacs Mencken, Prentice Mulford, Bret Hart, Charles Warren Stoddard, Fitzhugh Ludlow, Mark Twain, Orpheus C. Kerr, Artemis Ward, Gilbert Densmore, W. S. Kendall, and Mrs. Hitchcock assembled there at one time. The era office would seem to have been a sort of Mount Olympus, or Parnassus, perhaps, for these were mainly poets who had scarcely yet attained to the dignity of gods. Miller was hardly more than a youth then, and this grand assemblage impressed him, as did the imposing appointments of the place. The era rooms were elegant, he says, the most grandly carpeted and most gorgeously furnished that I have ever seen. Even now, in my memory, they seem to have been simply palatial. I have seen the world well since then, all of its splendors worth seeing, yet those carpeted parlors, with Joe Lawrence and his brilliant satellites, outshine all these things as I turn to look back. More than any other city west of the Alleghenies, San Francisco has always been a literary center, and certainly that was a remarkable group to be out there under the sunset, dropped down there behind the Sierras, which the transcontinental railway would not climb yet for several years. They were a happy-hearted, aspiring lot, and they got as much as five dollars sometimes for an era article and were as proud of it as if it had been a great deal more. They felt that they were creating literature, as they were, in fact. A new school of American letters mustered there. Mark Twain and Bret Hart were distinctive features of this group. They were already recognized by their associates as belonging in a class by themselves, though as yet neither had done any of the work for which he would be remembered later. They were a good deal together and it was when Hart was made editor of the Californian that Mark Twain was put on the weekly staff at the then unexampled twelve-dollar rate. The Californian made larger pretensions than the era, and perhaps had a heavier financial backing. With Mark Twain on the staff, and Bret Hart in the chair, himself a frequent contributor, it easily ranked as first of San Francisco periodicals. A number of the sketches collected by Webb later, in Mark Twain's first little volume, The Celebrated Jumping Frog, etc., appeared in the Era or Californian in 1864 and 1865. They were smart, bright, direct, not always refined, but probably the best humor of the day. Some of them are still preserved in this volume of sketches. They are interesting in what they promise rather than in what they present, though some of them are still delightful enough. The killing of Julius Caesar localized, 
is an excellent forerunner of his burlesque report of a gladiatorial combat in the innocents abroad the answers to correspondence with his vigorous admonition of the statistical moralist could hardly have been better done at any later period the jumping frog itself was not originally of this harvest it has a history of its own as we shall see a little further along the repertorial arrangement was of brief duration even the great san francisco earthquake of that day did not awaken in mark twain any permanent enthusiasm for the drudgery of the call he had lost interest and when mark twain lost interest in a subject or an undertaking that subject or that undertaking were better dead so far as he was concerned his conclusion of service with the call was certain and he wondered daily why it was delayed so long the connection had become equally unsatisfactory to proprietor and employee they had a heart-to-heart -heart talk presently with the result that mark twain was free he used to claim in after years with his usual tendency to confess the worst of himself that he was discharged and the incident has been variously told george barnes himself has declared that clemens resigned with great willingness it is very likely that the paragraph at the end of chapter fifty eight in roughing it presents the situation with fair accuracy though as always the author makes it as unpleasant for himself as possible at last one of the proprietors took me aside with a charity i still remember with considerable respect and gave me an opportunity to resign my berth and so save myself the disgrace of a dismissal as an extreme contrast with the supposititious butterfly idleness of his beginning in san francisco and for no other discoverable reason he doubtless thought it necessary in the next chapter of that book to depict himself as having reached the depths of hard luck debt and poverty i became an adept at slinking he says i slunk from back street to back street i slunk to my bed i had pawned everything but the clothes i had on this is pure fiction that he occasionally found himself short of funds is likely enough a literary life invites that sort of thing but that he ever clung to a single silver ten-cent piece as he tells us and became the familiar of mendicancy was a condition supplied altogether by his later imagination to satisfy what he must have regarded as an artistic need almost immediately following his separation from the call he arranged with goodman to write a daily letter for the enterprise reporting san francisco matters after his own notion with a free hand his payment for this work was thirty dollars a week and he had an additional return from his literary sketches the arrangement was an improvement both as to labor and income real affluence appeared on the horizon just then in the form of a liberal offer for the tennessee land but alas it was from a wine-grower who wished to turn the tract into great vineyards and orion had a prohibition seizure at the moment so the trade was not made orion further argued that the prospective purchaser would necessarily be obliged to import horticultural labor from europe and that those people might be homesick badly treated and consequently unhappy in those far eastern tennessee mountains such was orion's way end of chapter forty seven bohemian days read by john greenman this is section forty eight of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter forty eight the refuge of the hills those who remember mark twain's enterprise letters they are no longer obtainable note many of these are indeed now obtainable by simple web search 
david widger project gutenberg declare them to have been the greatest series of daily philippics ever written however this may be it is certain that they made a stir goodman permitted him to say absolutely what he pleased upon any subject san francisco was fairly weltering in corruption official and private he assailed whatever came first to hand with all the fierceness of a flaming indignation long restrained quite naturally he attacked the police and with such ferocity and penetration that as soon as copies of the enterprise came from virginia the city hall began to boil and smoke and threaten trouble martin g burke then chief of police entered libel suit against the enterprise prodigiously advertising that paper copies of which were snatched as soon as the stage brought them mark twain really let himself go then he wrote a letter that on the outside was marked be sure and let joe see this before it goes in he even doubted himself whether goodman would dare to print it after reading it was a letter describing the city's corrupt morals under the existing police government it began the air is full of lechery and rumors of lechery and continued in a strain which made even the enterprise printers aghast you can never afford to publish that the foreman said to goodman let it all go in every word goodman answered if mark can stand it i can it seemed unfortunate at the time that steve gillis should select this particular moment to stir up trouble that would involve both himself and clemens with the very officials which the latter had undertaken to punish passing a saloon one night alone gillis heard an altercation going on inside and very naturally stepped in to enjoy it including the barkeeper there were three against two steve ranged himself on the weaker side and selected the barkeeper a big bruiser who when the fight was over was ready for the hospital it turned out that he was one of chief burke's minions and gillis was presently indicted on a charge of assault with intent to kill he knew some of the officials in a friendly way and was advised to give a straw bond and go into temporary retirement clemens of course went his bail and steve set out for virginia city until the storm blew over this was burke's opportunity when the case was called and gillis did not appear burke promptly instituted an action against his bondsman with an execution against his loose property the watch that had been given him as governor of the third house came near being thus sacrificed in the cause of friendship and was only saved by skillful manipulation now it was down in the chain of circumstances that steve gillis's brother james n gillis a gentle-hearted hermit a pocket miner of the halcyon tuolumne district the truthful james of bret harte happened to be in san francisco at this time and invited clemens to return with him to the far seclusion of his cabin on jackass hill in that peaceful retreat were always rest and refreshment for the wayfarer and more than one weary writer besides bret harte had found shelter there james gillis himself had fine literary instincts but he remained a pocket miner because he loved that quiet pursuit of gold the arcadian life the companionship of his books the occasional bohemian pilgrim who found refuge in his retreat it is said that the sick were made well and the well made better in jim gillis's cabin on the hilltop where the air was nectar and the stillness like enchantment one could mine there if he wished to do so jim would always furnish him a promising claim and teach him the art of following the little fan-like drift of gold specks to the nested deposit of nuggets somewhere up the hillside he regularly shared his cabin with one dick stoker dick baker of roughing it another genial soul who long ago had retired from the world to this forgotten land also with dick's cat tom quartz but there was always room for guests in roughing it and in a later story the californian's tale mark twain has made us acquainted with the verdant solitude of the tuolumne hills that dreamy delicious paradise where once a vast population had gathered when placer mining had been in its bloom a dozen years before the human swarm had scattered when the washings failed to pay leaving only a quiet emptiness and the few pocket miners along the stanislaus and among the hills 
Vast areas of that section present a strange appearance today. Long stretches there are, crowded and jammed, and drifted with ghostly white stones that stand up like fossils of a prehistoric life. The earth's deposit, which once covered them, entirely washed away, every particle of it removed by the greedy hordes, leaving only this vast, bleaching drift, literally the picked bones of the land. At one place stands Columbia, regarded once as a rival to Sacramento, a possible state capital, a few tumbling shanties now, and a ruined church. It was the 4th of December, 1864, when Mark Twain arrived at Jim Gillis's cabin. He found it a humble habitation made of logs and slabs, partly sheltered by a great live oak tree surrounded by a stretch of grass. It had not much in the way of pretentious furniture, but there was a large fireplace and a library which included the standard authors. A younger Gillis boy, William, was there at this time, so that the family numbered five in all, including Tom Quartz, the cat. On rainy days they would gather about the big open fire, and Jim Gillis, with his back to the warmth, would relate diverting yarns, creation of his own, turned out hot from the anvil, forged as he went along. He had a startling imagination, and he had fostered in it that secluded place. His stories usually consisted of wonderful adventures of his companion, Dick Stoker, portrayed with humor, and that serene and vagrant fancy which builds as it goes, careless as to whither it is proceeding and whether the story shall end well or ill, soon or late, if ever. He always pretended that these extravagant tales of Stoker were strictly true, and Stoker, forty-six and gray as a rat, earnest thoughtful and tranquilly serene, would smoke and look into the fire and listen to those astonishing things of himself, smiling a little now and then, but saying never a word. What did it matter to him? He had no world outside of the cabin and the hills, no affairs. He would live and die there. His affairs all had ended long ago. A number of the stories used in Mark Twain's books were first told by Jim Gillis standing with his hands crossed behind him back to the fire in the cabin on jackass hill the story of dick baker's cat was one of these the jaybird and acorn story of a tramp abroad was another also the story of the burning shame and there are others mark twain had little to add to these stories in fact he never could get them to sound as well he said as when jim gillis had told them James Gillis's imagination sometimes led him into difficulties. Once a feeble old squaw came along selling some fruit that looked like green plums. Stoker, who knew the fruit well enough, carelessly ventured the remark that it might be all right, but he had never heard of anybody eating it, which set Gillis off into eloquent praises of its delights, all of which he knew to be purely imaginary. Whereupon Stoker told him if he liked the fruit so well, to buy some of it. There was no escape after that. Jim had to buy some of those plums, whose acid was of the hair-lifting aquafortis variety, and all the rest of the day he stewed them, adding sugar, trying to make them palatable, tasting them now and then, boasting, meanwhile, of their nectar-like deliciousness. He gave the others a taste, by and by, a withering, corroding sup, and they derided him and rode him down. But Jim never weakened. He ate that fearful brew, and though for days his mouth was like fire, he still referred to the luscious, health-giving joys of the Californian plums. Jackass Hill was not altogether a solitude. Here and there were neighbors. Another pocket miner, named Carrington, had a cabin not far away, and a mile or two distant lived an old couple with a pair of pretty daughters, so plump and trim and innocent that they were called the chaparral quails. Young men from far and near paid court to them, and on Sunday afternoons so many horses would be tied to their front fence as to suggest an afternoon service there. Young Billy Gillis knew them, and one Sunday morning took his brother's friend, Sam Clemens, over for a call. They went early, with forethought, and promptly took the girls for a walk. 
They took a long walk, and went wandering over the hills toward Sandy Bar and the Stanislaus, through that reposeful land which Bret Harte would one day light with idyllic romance, and toward evening found themselves a long way from home. They must return by the nearest way to arrive before dark. One of the young ladies suggested a shortcut through the chemise, and they started. But they were lost presently, and it was late, very late, when at last they reached the ranch. The mother of the quails was sitting up for them, and she had something to say. She let go a perfect storm of general denunciation, then narrowed the attack to Samuel Clemens as the oldest of the party. He remained mildly serene. "'It wasn't my fault,' he ventured at last. "'It was Billy Gillis's fault.' "'No such thing. You know better. Mr. Gillis has been here often. It was you.' "'But do you realize, ma'am, how tired and hungry we are? H haven't you got a bite for us to eat?' no sir not a bite for such as you the offender's eyes wandering about the room spied something in a corner isn't that a guitar over there he asked yes sir it is what of it the culprit walked over and taking it up tuned the strings a little and struck the chords then he began to sing he began very softly and sang fly away pretty moth then Araby's daughter. He could sing very well in those days, following with the simpler chords. Perhaps the mother quail had known those songs herself back in the States, for her manner grew kindlier, almost with the first notes. When he had finished, she was the first to ask him to go on. "'I suppose you are just like all young folks,' she said. "'I was young myself once.' while you sing i'll get some supper she left the door to the kitchen open so that she could hear and cooked whatever she could find for the belated party end of chapter forty eight the refuge of the hills read by john greenman this is section forty nine of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 49 The Jumping Frog. It was the rainy season, the winter of 1864 and 1865, but there were many pleasant days when they could go pocket hunting, and Samuel Clemens soon added a knowledge of this fascinating science to his other acquirements. Sometimes he worked with Dick Stoker sometimes with one of the Gillis boys. He did not make his fortune at pocket-mining. He only laid its cornerstone. In the old notebook he kept of that sojourn we find that, with Jim Gillis, he made a trip over into Calaveras County soon after Christmas, and remained there until after New Year's, probably prospecting. And he records that on New Year's night, at Vallecito, he saw a magnificent lunar rainbow in a very light, drizzling rain. A lunax rainbow is one of the things people seldom see. He thought it an omen of good fortune. They returned to the cabin on the hill, but later in the month, on the 23rd, they crossed over into Calaveras again and began pocket-hunting not far from Angel's Camp. The notebook records that the bill of fare at the camp hotel consisted wholly of beans and something which bore the name of coffee also that the rains were frequent and heavy. January 27th. Same old diet, same old weather. Went out to the pocket claim, had to rush back. They had what they believed to be a good claim. Jim Gillis declared the indications promising, and if they could only have good weather to work it, they were sure of rich returns. For himself he would have been willing to work rain or shine. Clemens, however, had different views on the subject. His part was carrying water for washing out the pans of dirt, and carrying pails of water through the cold rain and mud was not very fascinating work. Dick Stoker came over before long to help. Things went a little better then. 
but most of their days were spent in the bar-room of the dilapidated tavern at Angel's Camp, enjoying the company of a former Illinois River pilot, Ben Coon. This name has been variously given as Ross Coon, Coon Drayton, etc. It is given here as set down in Mark Twain's notes, made on the spot. Coon was not, as has been stated, the proprietor of the hotel, which was kept by a Frenchman, but a frequenter of it a solemn, fat-witted person, who dozed by the stove or told slow, endless stories, without point or application. Listeners were a boon to him, for few came, and not many would stay. To Mark Twain and Jim Gillis, however, Ben Coon was a delight. It was soothing and comfortable to listen to his endless narratives, told in that solemn way, with no suspicion of humor even when his yarns had point he did not recognize it one dreary afternoon in his slow monotonous fashion he told them about a frog a frog that had belonged to a man named coleman who trained it to jump but that failed to win a wager because the owner of a rival frog had surreptitiously loaded the trained jumper with shot the story had circulated among the camps and a well-known journalist named samuel Sibo had already made a squib of it, but neither Clemens nor Gillis had ever happened to hear it before. They thought the tale in itself amusing, and the spectacle of a man drifting serenely along through such a queer yarn without ever smiling was exquisitely absurd. When Coon had talked himself out, his hearers played billiards on the frowsy table, and now and then one would remark to the other, "'I don't see no pints about that frog that's any better than any other frog.' And perhaps the other would answer, "'I ain't got no frog, but if I had a frog I'd bet you.' Out on the claim between pails of water, Clemens, as he watched Jim Gillis or Dick Stoker washing, would be apt to say, "'I don't see no points about that pan of dirt it's any better than any other pan of dirt and so they kept it up then the rain would come again and interfere with their work one afternoon when clemens and gillis were following certain tiny sprayed specks of gold that were leading them to pocket somewhere up the long slope the chill downpour set in gillis as usual was washing and clemens carrying water the color was getting better with every pan, and Jim Gillis believed that now, after their long waiting, they were to be rewarded. Possessed with the miner's passion, he would have gone on washing and climbing toward the precious pocket, regardless of everything. Clemens, however, shivering and disgusted, swore that each pail of water was his last. His teeth were chattering, and he was wet through. Finally, he said, in his deliberate way, jim i won't carry any more water this work is too disagreeable gillis had just taken out a panful of dirt bring one more pail sam he pleaded oh hell jim i won't do it i'm freezing just one more pail sam he pleaded no sir not a drop not if i knew there were a million dollars in that pan. Gillis tore a page out of his notebook and hastily posted a thirty-day claim notice by the pan of dirt, and they set out for Angel's camp. It kept on raining and storming, and they did not go back. A few days later, a letter from Steve Gillis made Clemens decide to return to San Francisco. With Jim Gillis and Dick Stoker, he left Angel's and walked across the mountains to Jackass Hill in the snowstorm. The first I ever saw in California, he says in his notes. In the meantime the rain had washed away the top of the pan of earth they had left standing on the hillside, and exposed a handful of nuggets, pure gold. Two strangers, Austrians, had come along, and, observing it, had sat down to wait until the thirty-day claim notice posted by Jim Killis should expire. They did not mind the rain not with all that gold in sight, and the minute the thirty days were up they followed the lead a few pans farther and took out some, say, ten, 
some say twenty thousand dollars in either case it was a good pocket mark twain missed it by one pail of water still it is just as well perhaps when one remembers that vaster nugget of angel's camp the jumping frog jim gillis always declared if sam had got that pocket he would have remained a pocket miner to the end of his days like me in mark twain's old notebook occurs a memorandum of the frog story a mere casual entry of its main features coleman with his jumping frog bet stranger fifty dollars stranger had no frog and c got him one in the meantime stranger filled c's frog full of shot and he couldn't jump the stranger's frog won it seemed unimportant enough no doubt at the time but it was the nucleus around which was built a surpassing fame the hills along the stanislaus have turned out some wonderful nuggets in their time but no other of such size as that end of chapter forty nine the jumping frog read by john greenman section fifty of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter fifty back to the tumult from the notebook february twenty fifth arrived in stockton five p m home again home again at the occidental hotel san francisco find letters from artemus ward asking me to write a sketch for his new book of nevada territory travels which is soon to come out too late ought to have got the letters three months ago they are dated early in november he was sorry not to oblige ward sorry also not to have representation in his book he wrote explaining the circumstance and telling the story of his absence steve gillis meantime had returned to san francisco and settled his difficulties there the friends again took up residence together mark twain resumed his daily letters to the enterprise without further annoyance from official sources perhaps there was a temporary truce in that direction though he continued to attack various abuses civic private and artistic becoming a sort of general censor establishing for himself the title of the moralist of the main the letters were reprinted in san francisco and widely read now and then some one had the temerity to answer them but most of his victims maintained a discreet silence in one of these letters he told of the mexican oyster a rather tough unsatisfactory article of diet which could not stand criticism and presently disappeared from the market it was a mistake however for him to attack an alta journalist by the name of evans evans was a poet and once composed an elegy with a refrain which ended gone 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 to his endeavor gone 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 forever and forever in the enterprise letter following its publication mark twain referred to this poem he parodied the refrain and added if there is any criticism to make on it i should say there is a little too much gone and not enough forever it was a more or less pointless witticism but it had a humorous quotable flavor and it made evans mad in a squib in the alta he retaliated mark twain has killed the mexican oyster we only regret that the act was not inspired by a worthier motive mark twain's sole reason for attacking the mexican oyster was because the restaurant that sold them refused him credit a deadly thrust like that could not be parried in print to deny or recriminate would be to appear ridiculous one could only sweat and breathe vengeance 
joe he said to goodman who had come over for a visit my one object in life now is to make enough money to stand trial and then go and murder evans he wrote verses himself sometimes and lightened his enterprise letters with jingles one of these concerned tom mcguire the autocrat manager of san francisco theaters it details mcguire's assault on one of his actors tom mcguire roused to ire lighted on mcdougal tore his coat clutched his throat and split him in the bugle for shame o oh fie mcguire why will you thus skyugle why curse and swear and rip and tear the innocent mcdougal of bones bereft almost you've left vestvali gentle jew gal and now you've smashed and almost hashed the form of poor mcdougal goodman remembers that clemens and gillis were together again on california street at this time and of hearing them sing the doleful ballad of the rejected lover another of mark twain's compositions it was a wild blasphemous outburst and the furious fervor with which mark and steve delivered it standing side by side and waving their fists did not render it less objectionable such memories as these are set down here for they exhibit a phase of that robust personality built of the same primeval material from which the world was created built of every variety of material in fact ever incorporated in a human being equally capable of writing unprintable coarseness and that rarest and most tender of all characterizations the recollections of joan of arc end of chapter fifty back to the tumult read by john greenman this is section fifty one of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter fifty one the cornerstone along with his enterprise work clemens continued to write occasionally for the californian but for some reason he did not offer the story of the jumping frog for one thing he did not regard it highly as literary material he knew that he had enjoyed it himself but the humor and fashion of its telling seemed to him of too simple and mild a variety in that day of boisterous incident and exaggerated form by and by artemus ward turned up in san francisco and one night mark twain told him his experiences with jim gillis and in angel's camp also of ben coon and his tale of the calaveras frog ward was delighted write it he said there is still time to get it into my volume of sketches send it to carleton my publisher in new york this is in accordance with mr clemens recollection of the matter the author can find no positive evidence that ward was on the pacific coast again in eighteen sixty five it seems likely therefore that the telling of the frog story and his approval of it were accomplished by exchange of letters clemens promised to do this but delayed fulfillment somewhat and by the time the sketch reached carleton ward's book was about ready for the press it did not seem worth while to carleton to make any change of plans that would include the frog story the publisher handed it over to henry clapp editor of the saturday press a perishing sheet saying here clapp here's something you can use in your paper clapp took it thankfully enough we may believe jim smiley and his jumping frog this was the original title appeared in the saturday press of november eighteenth eighteen sixty five and was immediately copied and quoted far and near it brought the name of mark twain across the mountains bore it up and down the atlantic coast and out over the prairies of the middle west away from the pacific slope only a reader here and there had known the name before now everyone who took a newspaper was treated to the tale of the wonderful calaveras frog and received a mental impress of the author's signature the name mark twain became hardly an institution as yet 
but it made a strong bid for national acceptance. As for its owner, he had no suspicion of these momentous happenings for a considerable time. The telegraph did not carry such news in those days, and it took a good while for the echo of his victory to travel to the coast. When at last a lagging word of it did arrive, it would seem to have brought disappointment rather than exultation to the author. Even Artemus Ward's opinion of the story had not increased Mark Twain's regard of it as literature. That it had struck the popular note meant, as he believed, failure for his more highly regarded work. In a letter written January 20th, 1866, he says these things for himself. I do not know what to write. My life is so uneventful. I wish I was back there piloting up and down the river again. Verily all is vanity, and little worth save piloting. To think that after writing many an article a man might be excused for thinking tolerably good, those New York people should single out a villainous backwoods sketch to compliment me on. Jim Smiley and his jumping frog, a squib which would never have been written but to please Artemus Ward, and then it reached New York too late to appear in his book. But no matter, his book was a wretchedly poor one, generally speaking, and it could be no credit to either of us to appear between its covers. This paragraph is from the New York correspondence of the San Francisco Alta. Mark Twain's story in the Saturday Press of November 18th, called Jim Smiley and His Jumping Frog, has set all New York in a roar, and he may be said to have made his mark. I have been asked fifty times about it and its author, and the papers are copying it far and near. It is voted the best thing of the day. Cannot the Californian afford to keep Mark all to itself? It should not let him scintillate so widely without first being filtered through the California press. The New York publishing house of Carlton and Company gave the sketch to the Saturday press when they found it was too late for the book. It is difficult to judge the jumping frog story today. It has the intrinsic fundamental value of one of Aesop's fables. The resemblance of the frog story to the early Greek tales must have been noted by Professor Henry Sidgwick, who synopsized it in Greek form and phrase for his book Greek Prose Composition. Through this originated the impression that the story was of Athenian root. Mark Twain himself was deceived until, in 1899, when he met Professor Sidgwick, who explained that the Greek version was the translation and Mark Twain's the original, that he had thought it unnecessary to give credit for a story so well known. See The Jumping Frog, Harper and Brothers, 1903, page 64. It contains a basic idea which is essentially ludicrous, and the quaint simplicity of its telling is convincing and full of charm. It appeared in print at a time when American humor was chaotic, the public taste unformed. We had a vast appreciation for what was comic, with no great number of opportunities for showing it. We were so ready to laugh that when a real opportunity came along we improved it and kept on laughing and repeating the cause of our merriment, directing the attention of our friends to it. Whether the story of Jim Smiley's Frog, offered for the first time today, would capture the public and become the initial block of a towering fame, is another matter. That the author himself underrated it, it is certain. That the public, receiving it at what we now term the psychological moment, may have overrated it, is by no means impossible. In any case, it does not matter now. The stone rejected by the builder was made the cornerstone of his literary edifice. As such, it is immortal. In the letter already quoted, Clemens speaks of both Bret Harte 
and himself as having quit the californian and mentions that in future they expected to write for eastern papers he adds though i am generally placed at the head of my breed of scribblers in this part of the country the place properly belongs to bret harte i think though he denies it along with the rest he wants me to club a lot of old sketches together with a lot of his and publish a book i wouldn't do it only he agrees to take all the trouble but i want to know whether we are going to make anything out of it first however he has written to a new york publisher and if we are offered a bargain that will pay for a month's labor we will go to work and prepare the volume for the press nothing came of the proposed volume or of other joint literary schemes these two had then in mind neither of them would seem to have been optimistic as to their future place in american literature certainly in their most exalted moments they could hardly have dreamed that within half a dozen years they would be the head and front of a new school of letters the two most talked of men in america end of chapter fifty one the cornerstone read by john greenman This is section 52 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 52 A Commission to the Sandwich Islands. Whatever his first emotions concerning the success of Jim Smiley's Frog may have been, the sudden astonishing leap of that batrachian into american literature gave the author an added prestige at home as well as in distant parts those about him were inclined to regard him in some degree at least as a national literary figure and to pay tribute accordingly special honors began to be shown to him a fine new steamer the ajax built for the sandwich island trade carried on its initial trip a select party of guests of which he was invited to make one he did not go and reproached himself sorrowfully afterward if the ajax were back i would go quick and throw up my correspondence she had fifty-two invited guests aboard the cream of the town gentlemen and ladies and a splendid brass band i could not accept because there would be no one to write my correspondence while i was gone in fact the daily letter had grown monotonous he was restless and the ajax excursion which he had been obliged to forego made him still more dissatisfied an idea occurred to him the sugar industry of the islands was a matter of great commercial interest to california while the life and scenery there picturesquely treated would appeal to the general reader he was on excellent terms with james anthony and paul morrill of the sacramento union he proposed to them that they send him as their special correspondent to report to their readers in a series of letters life trade agriculture and general aspect of the islands to his vast delight they gave him the commission he wrote home joyously now i am to remain there a month and ransack the islands the cataracts and volcanoes completely and write twenty or thirty letters for which they pay as much money as i would get if i stayed at home he adds that on his return he expects to start straight across the continent by way of the columbia river the pendore lakes through montana and down the missouri river only two hundred miles of land travel from san francisco to new orleans so it is man proposes while fate undisturbed spins serenely on
he sailed by the ajax on her next trip march seventh eighteen sixty six beginning his first sea voyage a brand new experience during which he acquired the names of the sails and parts of the ship with considerable knowledge of navigation and of the islands he was to visit whatever information passengers and sailors could furnish it was a happy stormy voyage altogether in roughing it he has given us some account of it it was the eighteenth of march when he arrived at honolulu and his first impression of that tranquil harbor remained with him always in fact his whole visit there became one of those memory pictures full of golden sunlight and peace to be found somewhere in every human past the letters of introduction he had brought and the reputation which had preceded him guaranteed him welcome and hospitality officials and private citizens were alike ready to show him their pleasant land and he fairly reveled in its delicious air its summer warmth its soft repose oh islands there are on the face of the deep where the leaves never fade and the skies never weep he quotes in his notebook and adds went with mr damon to his cool vine-shaded home no careworn or eager anxious faces in this land of happy contentment god what a contrast with california and the washoe and in another place they live in the s i no rush no worry merchant goes down to his store like a gentleman at nine goes home at four and thinks no more of business till next day damned san f style of wearing out life he fitted in with the languorous island existence but he had come for business and he lost not much time he found there a number of friends from washoe including the rev mr rising whose health had failed from overwork by their direction and under official guidance he set out on oahu one of the several curious horses he has immortalized in print and accompanied by a pleasant party of ladies and gentlemen encircled the island of that name crossed it and recrossed it visited its various battlefields returning to honolulu lame sore sunburnt but triumphant his letters home better even than his union correspondence reveal his personal interest and enthusiasms i have got a lot of human bones which i took from one of these battlefields i guess i will bring you some of them i went with the american minister and took dinner this evening with the king's grand chamberlain who is related to the royal family and though darker than a mulatto he has an excellent english education and in manners is an accomplished gentleman he is to call for me in the morning we will visit the king in the palace after dinner they called in the singing girls and we had some beautiful music sung in the native tongue it was his first association with royalty and it was human that he should air it a little in the same letter he states i will sail in a day or two on a tour of the other islands to be gone two months in roughing it he has given us a picture of his visits to the islands their plantations their volcanoes their natural and historic wonders he was an insatiable sightseer then and a persevering one the very name of a new point of interest filled him with an eager enthusiasm to be off no discomfort or risk or distance discouraged him with a single daring companion a man who said he could find the way he crossed the burning floor of the mighty crater of kilauea then in almost constant eruption racing across the burning lava floor jumping wide and bottomless crevices when a misstep would have meant death 
By and by Marlette shouted, Stop! I never stopped quicker in my life. I asked what the matter was. He said we were out of the path. He said we must not try to go on until we found it again, for we were surrounded with beds of rotten lava, through which we could easily break and plunge down one thousand feet. I thought eight hundred would answer for me, and was about to say so, when Marlette partly proved his statement, crushing through and disappearing to his armpits. They made their way across at last, and stood the rest of the night gazing down upon a spectacle of a crater in quivering action, a veritable lake of fire. They had risked their lives for that scene, but it seemed worth while. His open-air life on the river and the mining camps had prepared Samuel Clemens for adventurous hardships. He was thirty years old, with his full account of mental and physical capital. His growth had been slow, but he was entering now upon his golden age. He was fitted for conquest of whatever sort, and he was beginning to realize his power. End of chapter 52 A Commission to the Sandwich Islands Read by John Greenman This is section 53 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866 Chapter 53 Anson Burlingame and the Hornet Disaster. It was near the end of June when he returned to Honolulu from a tour of all the islands, fairly worn out and prostrated with saddle boils. He expected only to rest and be quiet for a season, but all unknown to him, startling and historic things were taking place in which he was to have a part, events that would mark another forward stride in his career. The Ajax had just come in, bringing His Excellency Anson Burlingame, then returning to his post as Minister to China, also General Van Valkenburg, Minister to Japan, Colonel Rumsey and Minister Burlingame's son, Edward, Edward L. Burlingame, now for many years editor of Scribner's Magazine, then a lively boy of eighteen. Young Burlingame had read The Jumping Frog, and was enthusiastic about Mark Twain and his work. Learning that he was in Honolulu, laid up at his hotel, the party sent word that they would call on him next morning. Clemens felt that he must not accept this honor, sick or well. He crawled out of bed, dressed, and shaved himself as quickly as possible, and drove to the American minister's, where the party was staying. They had a hilariously good time. When he returned to his hotel, he sent them, by request, whatever he had on hand of his work. General Van Falkenberg had said to him, "'California is proud of Mark Twain, and some day the American people will be too, no doubt.' There has seldom been a more accurate prophecy. But a still greater event was imminent. On that very day, June twenty-first, 1866, there came word of the arrival at San Pajo, on the island of Hawaii, of an open boat containing fifteen starving wretches, who on short ten-day rations had been buffeting a stormy sea for forty-three days a vessel the hornet from new york had taken fire and burned on the line and since early may on that meagre sustenance they had been battling with hundreds of leagues of adverse billows seeking for land a few days following the first report eleven of the rescued men were brought to honolulu and placed in the hospital Mark Twain recognized the great news importance of the event. It would be a splendid beat if he could interview the castaways and be the first to get their story to his paper. There was no cable in those days. A vessel for San Francisco would sail next morning. It was the opportunity of a lifetime, and he must not miss it. Bedridden as he was, the undertaking seemed beyond his strength. But just at this time the Burlingame party descended on him, and almost before he knew it, he was on the way to the hospital on a cot, escorted by the heads of the joint legations of China and Japan. Once there, Anson Burlingame, 
with his splendid human sympathy and handsome courtly presence drew from those enfeebled castaways all the story of their long privation and struggle that had stretched across forty-three distempered days and four thousand miles of sea all that mark twain had to do was to listen and make the notes he put in the night writing against time next morning just as the vessel for the states was drifting away from her dock a strong hand flung his bulky envelope of manuscript aboard and if the vessel arrived his great beat was sure it did arrive and the three-column story on the front page of the sacramento union in its issue of july nineteenth gave the public the first detailed history of the terrible hornet disaster and the rescue of those starving men such a story occupied a wider place in the public interest than it would in these crowded days the telegraph carried it everywhere and it was featured as a sensation mark twain always adored the name and memory of anson burlingame in his letter home he tells of burlingame's magnanimity in throwing away an invitation to dine with princes and foreign dignitaries to help him you know i appreciate that kind of thing he says which was a true statement and in future years he never missed an opportunity of paying an installment on his debt of gratitude it was proper that he should do so for the obligation was a far greater one than that contracted in obtaining the tale of the hornet disaster it was the debt which one owes to a man who from the deep measure of his understanding gives encouragement and exactly needed and convincing advice anson burlingame said to samuel clemens you have great ability i believe you have genius what you need now is the refinement of association seek companionship among men of superior intellect and character refine yourself and your work never affiliate with inferiors always climb clemens never forgot that advice he did not always observe it but he rarely failed to realize its gospel burlingame urged him to travel come to pekin next winter he said and visit me make my house your home i will give you letters and introduce you you will have facilities for acquiring information about china it is not surprising then that mark twain never felt his debt to anson burlingame entirely paid burlingame came more than once to the hotel for clemens was really ill now and they discussed plans for his future betterment he promised of course to visit china and when he was alone put in a good deal of time planning a trip around the world which would include the great capitals when not otherwise employed he read though there was only one book in the hotel a blue and gold edition of dr holmes songs in many keys and this he soon knew almost by heart from title page to finis he was soon up and about no one could remain ill long in those happy islands young burlingame came and suggested walks once when clemens hesitated the young man said but there is a scriptural command for you to go if you can quote one i'll obey it said clemens very well the bible says if any man require thee to walk a mile go with him twain the command was regarded as sufficient clemens quoted the witticism later in his first lecture and it was often repeated in after years ascribed to warner ward and a dozen others its origin was as here set down under date of july fourth eighteen sixty six mark twain's sandwich island notebook says went to a ball eight thirty p m danced till twelve thirty stopped at general van valkenburg's room and talked with him and mr burlingame and ed burlingame until three a m from which we may conclude that he had altogether recovered a few days later the legation party had sailed for china and japan and on the nineteenth clemens himself set out by a slow sailing vessel to san francisco they were becalmed and were twenty-five days making the voyage captain mitchell and others of the wrecked hornet were aboard and he put in a good deal of time copying their diaries and preparing a magazine article which he believed would prove his real entrance to the literary world 
the vessel lay almost perfectly still day after day and became a regular playground at sea sundays they had services and mark twain led the choir i hope they will have a better opinion of our music in heaven than i have down here he says in his notes if they don't a thunderbolt will knock this vessel endways it is perhaps worthy of mention that on the night of the twenty seventh of july he records having seen another splendidly colored lunar rainbow that he regarded this as an indication of future good fortune is not surprising considering the events of the previous year it was august thirteenth when he reached san francisco and the notebook entry of that day says home again no not home again in prison again and all the wild sense of freedom gone the city seems so cramped and so dreary with toil and care and business anxiety god help me i wish i were at sea again there were compensations however he went over to sacramento and was abundantly welcomed it was agreed that in addition to the twenty dollars allowed for each letter a special bill should be made for the hornet report how much do you think it ought to be mark james anthony asked oh i'm a modest man i don't want the whole union office call it one hundred dollars a column there was a general laugh the bill was made out at that figure and he took it to the business office for payment the cashier didn't faint he wrote many years later but he came rather near it he sent for the proprietors and they only laughed in their jolly fashion and said it was a robbery but no matter pay it it's all right the best men that ever owned a newspaper my debut as a literary person collected works though inferior to the descriptive writing which a year later would give him a world-wide fame the sandwich island letters added greatly to his prestige on the pacific coast they were convincing informing tersely even eloquently descriptive with a vein of humor adapted to their audience yet to read them now in the fine nonpareil type in which they were set is such a wearying task that one can only marvel at their popularity they were not brilliant literature by our standards to-day their humor is usually of a muscular kind varied with grotesque exaggerations the literary quality is pretty attenuated here and there are attempts at verse he had a fashion in those days of combining two or more poems with distracting sometimes amusing effect examples of these dislocations occur in the union letters a single stanza will present the general idea the assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold the turf with their bayonets turning and his cohorts were gleaming with purple and gold and our lanterns dimly burning only a trifling portion of the letters found their way into his sandwich island chapters of roughing it five years later they do however reveal a sort of transition stage between the riotous fluorescence of the comstock and the mellowness of his later style he was learning to see things with better eyes from a better point of view it is not difficult to believe that this literary change of heart was in no small measure due to the influence of anson burlingame end of chapter fifty three anson burlingame and the hornet disaster read by john greenman this is section fifty four of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter fifty four the lecturer 
It was not easy to take up the daily struggle again, but it was necessary. Clemens once declared he had been so blue at this period that one morning he put a loaded pistol to his head, but found he lacked courage to pull the trigger. Out of the ruck of possibilities, his brain always thronged with plans, he constructed three or four resolves. The chief of these was the trip around the world, but that lay months ahead, and in the meantime ways and means must be provided. Another intention was to finish the Hornet article and forward it to Harper's Magazine, a purpose carried immediately into effect. To his delight the article found acceptance, and he looked forward to a day of its publication as the beginning of a real career. He intended to follow it up with a series on the islands, which in due time might result in a book and an income. He had gone so far as to experiment with a dedication for the book, an inscription to his mother, modified later for use in The Innocents Abroad. A third plan of action was to take advantage of the popularity of the Hawaiian letters and deliver a lecture on the same subject. But this was a fearsome prospect. He trembled when he thought of it. As governor of the third house he had been extravagantly received and applauded, but in that case the position of public entertainer had been thrust upon him. To come forward now, offering himself in the same capacity, was a different matter. He believed he could entertain, but he lacked the courage to declare himself. Besides, it meant a risk of his slender capital. He confided his situation to Colonel John McComb of the Alta California, and was startled by McComb's vigorous endorsement. "'Do it, by all means,' urged McComb. "'It will be a grand success, I know it. Take the largest house in town, and charge a dollar a ticket.' Frightened, but resolute, he went to the leading theater manager, the same Tom McGuire of his verses, and was offered the new opera house at half rates. The next day this advertisement appeared. McGuire's Academy of Music, Pine Street, near Montgomery. The Sandwich Islands, Mark Twain. Honolulu correspondent of the Sacramento Union will deliver a lecture on the Sandwich Islands at the Academy of Music on Tuesday evening, October 2nd, 1866, in which passing mention will be made of Harris, Bishop Staley, the American missionaries, etc., and the absurd customs and characteristics of the natives duly discussed and described. The great volcano of Kilauea will also receive proper attention. A splendid orchestra is in town, but has not been engaged. Also, a den of ferocious wild beasts will be on exhibition in the next block. Magnificent fireworks were in contemplation for this occasion, but the idea has been abandoned. A grand torchlight procession may be expected. In fact, the public are privileged to expect whatever they please. Dress circle, one dollar. Family circle, fifty cents. Doors open at seven o'clock. The trouble to begin at eight o'clock. The story of that first lecture, as told in Roughing It, is a faithful one, and need only be summarized here. Expecting to find the house empty, he found it packed from the floodlights to the walls. Sidling out from the wings, wobbly kneed and dry of tongue, he was greeted by a murmur, a roar, a very crash of applause that frightened away his remaining vestiges of courage. Then came reaction. These were his friends, and he began to talk to them. Fear melted away, and as tide after tide of applause rose and billowed and came breaking at his feet, he knew something of the exaltation of Monte Cristo when he declared, The world is mine. It was a vast satisfaction to have succeeded. It was particularly gratifying at this time, for he dreaded going back into newspaper harness. Also, it softened later the disappointment resulting from another venture, for when the December Harper appeared with his article, the printer and proofreader had somehow converted Mark Twain into Mark Swain, and his literary dream perished. As to the literary value of his lecture, it was much higher than had been any portion of his letters, if we may judge from its few remaining fragments. One of these, 
a part of the description of the great volcano Haleakala on the island of Maui, is a fair example of his eloquence. It is somewhat more florid than his later description of the same scene in Roughing It, which it otherwise resembles, and we may imagine that its poetry, with the added charm of its delivery, held breathless his hearers, many of whom believed that no purer eloquence had ever been uttered or written. It is worth remembering, too, that in this lecture, delivered so long ago, he advocated the idea of American ownership of these islands, dwelling at considerable length on his reasons for this ideal. For fragmentary extracts from this first lecture of Mark Twain and news comment, see Appendix D, end of last volume. There was a gross return from his venture of more than $1,200, but with his usual business insight, which was never foresight, he had made an arrangement by which, after paying bills and dividing with his manager, he had only about one-third of this sum left. Still, even this was prosperity and triumph. He had acquired a new and lucrative profession at a bound. The papers lauded him as the most piquant and humorous writer and lecturer on the coast since the days of the lamented John Phoenix. He felt that he was on the high road at last. Dennis McCarthy, late of the Enterprise, was in San Francisco, and was willing to become his manager. Dennis was capable and honest, and Clemens was fond of him. They planned a tour of the nearby towns, beginning with Sacramento, extending it later even to the mining camps, such as Red Dog and Grass Valley, also across into Nevada, with engagements at Carson City, Virginia, and Gold Hill. It was an exultant and hilarious excursion, that first lecture tour made by Dennis McCarthy and Mark Twain. Success traveled with them everywhere, whether the lecturer looked across the floodlights of some pretentious opera house, or between the two tallow candles of some camp academy. Whatever the building, it was packed, and the returns were maximum. Those who remember him as a lecturer in that long-ago time say that his delivery was more quaint, his drawl more exaggerated even than in later life, that his appearance and movements on the stage were natural rather than graceful, that his manuscript, which he carried under his arm, looked like a ruffled hen. It was, in fact, originally written on sheets of manila paper in large characters so that it could be read easily by dim light, and it was doubtless often disordered. There was plenty of amusing experience on this tour. At one place, when the lecture was over, an old man came to him and said, "'Be them your natural tones of eloquence?' At Grass Valley there was a rival show, consisting of a lady tightrope walker and her husband. It was a small place, and the tightrope attraction seemed likely to fail. The lady's husband had formerly been a compositor on the Enterprise, so that he felt there was a bond of brotherhood between him and Mark Twain. "'Look here,' he said. "'Let's combine our shows. I'll let my wife do the tightrope walk outside and draw a crowd, and you go inside and lecture.' The arrangement was not made. Following custom, the lecturer at first thought it necessary to be introduced, and at each place McCarthy had to skirmish around and find the proper person. At Red Dog, on the Stanislaus, the man selected failed to appear, and Dennis had to provide another on short notice. He went down into the audience and captured an old fellow who ducked and dodged, but could not escape. Dennis led him to the stage, a good deal frightened. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he said, "'this is the celebrated Mark Twain from the celebrated city of San Francisco.' Uh, with his celebrated lecture about the uh, celebrated uh, Sandwich Islands. That was as far as he could go. But it was far enough. Mark Twain never had a better introduction. The audience was in a shouting humor from the start. Clemens himself used to tell of an introduction at another camp, where his sponsor said, Ladies and gentlemen, I know only two things about this man. The first is that he's never been in jail, 
and the second is i don't know why but this is probably apocryphal there is too much mark twain in it when he reached virginia goodman said to him sam you do not need anybody to introduce you there's a piano on the stage in the theater have it brought out in sight and when the curtain rises you be seated at the piano playing and singing that song of yours i had an old horse whose name was methuselah and uh, don't seem to notice that the curtain is up at first uh, then uh, be surprised when you suddenly find out that it is up and uh, begin talking uh, without any further preliminaries this proved good advice and the lecture thus opened started off with general hilarity and applause end of chapter fifty four the lecturer read by john greenman this is section fifty five of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter fifty five highway robbery his nevada lectures were bound to be immensely successful the people regarded him as their property over there and at carson and virginia the houses overflowed at virginia especially his friends urged and begged him to repeat the entertainment but he resolutely declined i have only one lecture yet he said i cannot bring myself to give it twice in the same town but that irresponsible imp steve gillis who was again in virginia conceived a plan which would make it not only necessary for him to lecture again but would supply him with a subject steve's plan was very simple it was to relieve the lecturer of his funds by a friendly highway robbery and let an account of the adventure furnish the new lecture in roughing it mark twain has given a version of this mock robbery which is correct enough as far as it goes but important details are lacking only a few years ago it was april nineteen o seven in his cabin on jackass hill with joseph goodman and the writer of this history present steve gillis made his deathbed confession as is here set down mark's lecture was given in piper's opera house october thirtieth eighteen sixty six the virginia city people had heard many famous lectures before but they were mere side shows compared with mark's it could have been run to crowded houses for a week we begged him to give the common people a chance but he refused to repeat himself he was going down to carson and was coming back to talk in gold hill about a week later and his agent dennis mccarthy and i laid a plan to have him robbed on the divide between gold hill and virginia after the gold hill lecture was over and he and dennis would be coming home with the money the divide was a good lonely place and was famous for its hold-ups we got city marshal george birdsall into it with us and took in leslie blackburn pat holland jimmy eddington and one or two more of sam's old friends we all loved him and would have fought for him in a moment that's the kind of friends mark had in nevada if he had any enemies i never heard of them we didn't take in dan de quill or joe here because sam was joe's guest and we were afraid he would tell him we didn't take in dan because we wanted him to write it up as a genuine robbery and make a big sensation that would pack the opera house at two dollars a seat to hear mark tell the story well everything went off pretty well about the time mark was finishing his lecture in gold hill the robbers all went up on the divide to wait but mark's audience gave him a kind of reception after his lecture and we nearly froze to death up there before he came along by and by i went back to see what was the matter sam and dennis were coming and carrying a carpet-sack about half full of silver between them i shadowed them and 
blew a policeman's whistle as a signal to the boys when the lecturers were within about a hundred yards of the place. I heard Sam say to Dennis, I'm glad they've got a policeman on the divide. They never had one in my day. Just about that time the boys, all with black masks on and silver dollars at the sides of their tongues to disguise their voices, stepped out and stuck six-shooters at Sam and Dennis and told them to put up their hands. The robbers called each other Beauregard and Stonewall Jackson. Of course, Dennis's hands went up and Mark's too, though Mark wasn't a bit scared or excited. He talked to the robbers in his regular fashion. He said, Don't flourish those pistols so promiscuously. They might go off by accident. They told him to hand over his watch and money, but when he started to take his hands down, they made him put them up again. Then he asked how they expected him to give them his valuables with his hands up in the sky. He said his treasures didn't lie in heaven. He told them not to take his watch, which was the one Sandy Baldwin and Theodore Winters had given him as governor of the third house, but we took it all the same. Whenever he started to put his hands down, we made him put them up again. Once he said, Don't you fellows be so rough. I was tenderly reared. Then we told him and Dennis to keep their hands up for fifteen minutes after we were gone. This was to give us time to get back to Virginia and be settled when they came along. As we were going away, Mark called, Say, you forgot something. What is it? Why, the carpet bag. He was cool all the time. Senator Bill Stewart, in his autobiography, tells a great story of how scared Mark was and how he ran. But Stewart was 3,000 miles from Virginia by that time and later got mad at Mark because he made a joke about him in roughing it. Dennis wanted to take his hands down pretty soon after we were gone, but Mark said, No, Dennis. I'm used to obeying orders when they are given in that convincing way. We'll just keep our hands up another fifteen minutes or so for good measure. We were waiting in a big saloon on C Street when Mark and Dennis came along. We knew they would come in, and we expected Mark would be excited, but he was as unruffled as a mountain lake. He told us, they had been robbed and asked me if I had any money. I gave him a hundred dollars of his own money, and he ordered refreshments for everybody. Then we adjourned to the Enterprise office, where he offered a reward, and Dan DeQuill wrote up the story and telegraphed it to the other newspapers. Then somebody suggested that Mark would have to give another lecture now, and that the robbery would make a great subject. He entered right into the thing, and next day we engaged Piper's Opera House, and people were offering five dollars apiece for front seats. It would have been the biggest thing that ever came to Virginia if it had come off. But we made a mistake, then, by taking Sandy Baldwin into the joke. We took in Joe here, too, and gave him the watch and money to keep, which made it hard for Joe afterward. But it was Sandy Baldwin that ruined us. He had Mark out to dinner the night before the show was to come off, and after he got well warmed up with champagne, he thought it would be a smart thing to let Mark into what was really going on. Mark didn't see it our way. He was mad clear through. At this point Joseph Goodman took up the story. He said, Those devils put Sam's money, watch, keys, pencils, and all his things into my hands. I felt particularly mean at being made accessory to the crime, especially as Sam was my guest, and I had grave doubts as to how he would take it when he found out the robbery was not genuine. I felt terribly guilty when he said, Joe, those damned thieves took my keys, and I can't get into my trunk. Do you suppose you could get me a key that would fit my trunk? I said I thought I could during the day, and after Sam had gone I took his own key, put it in the fire, and burnt it to make it look black. 
then i took a file and scratched it here and there to make it look as if i had been fitting it to the lock feeling guilty all the time like a man who is trying to hide a murderer sam did not ask for his key that day and that evening he was invited to judge baldwin's to dinner i thought he looked pretty silent and solemn when he came home but he only said joe let's play cards i don't feel sleepy steve here and two or three of the other boys who had been active in the robbery were present and they did not like sam's manner so they excused themselves and left him alone with me we played a good while then he said joe these cards are greasy i have got some new ones in my trunk did you get that key today i fished out that burnt scratched up key with fear and trembling but he didn't seem to notice at all and presently returned with the cards and we played and played and played till one o'clock two o'clock sam hardly saying a word and i was wondering what was going to happen and by and by he laid down his cards and looked at me and said joe sandy baldwin told me all about that robbery tonight now joe i have found out that the law doesn't recognize a joke and i am going to send every one of those fellows to the penitentiary he said it with such solemn gravity and such vindictiveness that i believed he was in dead earnest i know that i put in two hours of the hardest work i ever did trying to talk him out of that resolution i used all the arguments about the boys being his oldest friends how they all loved him how the joke had been entirely for his own good i pleaded with him begged him to reconsider i went and got his money and his watch and laid them on the table but for a time it seemed hopeless and i could imagine those fellows going behind the bars and the sensation it would make in california and just as i was about to give it up he said well joe i'll let it pass this time i'll forgive them again i've had to do it so many times but if i should see dennis mccarthy and steve gillis mounting the scaffold tomorrow, and i could save them by turning over my hand i wouldn't do it he canceled the lecture engagement however next morning and the day after left on the pioneer stage by the way of donner lake for california the boys came rather sheepishly to see him off but he would make no show of relenting when they introduced themselves as beauregard stonewall jackson etc he merely said yes and you'll all be behind the bars some day there's been a good deal of robbery around here lately and it's pretty clear now who did it they handed him a package containing the masks which the robbers had worn he received it in gloomy silence but as the stage drove away he put his head out of the window and after some pretty vigorous admonition resumed his old smile and called out good-bye friends good-bye thieves i bear you no malice so the heaviest joke was on his tormentors after all this is the story of the famous mark twain robbery direct from headquarters it has been garbled in so many ways that it seems worth settling down in full dennis mccarthy who joined him presently in san francisco received a little more punishment there what kind of a trip did you boys have a friend asked of them clemens just recovering from a cold which the exposure on the divide had given him smiled grimly oh pretty good only dennis here mistook it for a spree he lectured again in san francisco this time telling the story of his overland trip in eighteen sixty one and he did the daring thing of repeating three times the worn-out story of horace greeley's ride with hank monk as given later in roughing it people were deadly tired of that story out there and when he told it the first time with great seriousness they thought he must be failing mentally they did not laugh they only felt sorry he waited a little as if expecting a laugh and presently led around to it and told it again 
the audience was astonished still more and pitied him thoroughly he seemed to be waiting pathetically in the dead silence for their applause then went on with his lecture but presently with labored effort struggled around to the old story again and told it for the third time the audience suddenly saw the joke then and became vociferous and hysterical in their applause but it was a narrow escape he would have been hysterical himself if the relief had not come when it did a sidelight on the horace greeley story and on mr greeley's eccentricities is furnished by mr goodman when i was going east in eighteen sixty nine i happened to see hank monk just before i started mr goodman he said you tell horace greeley that i want to come east and ask him to send me a pass all right hank i said i will it happened that when i got to new york city one of the first men i met was greeley mr greeley i said i have a message for you from hank monk greeley bristled and glared at me that rascal he said he has done me more injury than any other man in america End of chapter 55 Highway Robbery Read by John Greenman This is section 56 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 56 Back to the States in the meantime clemens had completed his plan for sailing and had arranged with general mccomb of the alta california for letters during his proposed trip around the world however he meant to visit his people first and his old home he could go back with means now and with the prestige of success i sail to-morrow per opposition telegraphed you to-day he wrote on december fourteenth and a day later his notebook entry says sailed from san francisco in opposition line steamer america captain wakeman at noon fifteenth december eighteen sixty six pleasant sunny day hills brightly clad with green grass and shrubbery so he was really going home at last he had been gone five and a half years eventful adventurous years that had made him over completely at least so far as ambitions and equipment were concerned he had come away in his early manhood a printer and a pilot unknown outside of his class he was returning a man of thirty-one with a fund of hard experience three added professions mining journalism and lecturing also with a new name already famous on the sunset slopes of his adoption and beginning to be heard over the hills and far away in some degree at least he resembled the prince of a fairy tale who starting out humble and unnoticed wins his way through a hundred adventures and returns with gifts and honors the homeward voyage was a notable one it began with a tempest a little way out of san francisco a storm terrible but brief that brought the passengers from their berths to the deck and for a time set them praying then there was captain ned wakeman a big burly fearless sailor who had visited the edges of all continents and archipelagos who had been born at sea and never had a day's schooling in his life but he knew the bible by heart who was full of human nature and profanity and believed he was the only man on the globe who knew the secret of the bible miracles he became a distinct personality in mark twain's work the memory of him was an unfailing delight captain ned blakely in roughing it who with his own hands hanged bill noakes after reading him promiscuous chapters from the bible was captain wakeman captain stormfield who had the marvelous visit to heaven was likewise captain wakeman and he appears in the idle excursion and elsewhere another event of the voyage was crossing the nicaragua isthmus the trip across the lake and down the san juan river a brand new experience between shores of splendid tropic tangle gleaming with vivid life the luxuriance got into his notebook dark grottoes fairy festoons tunnels 
temples, columns, pillars, towers, pilasters, terraces, pyramids, mounds, domes, walls, in endless confusion of vine-work, no shape known to architecture, unimitated, and all so webbed together that short distances within are only gained by glimpses. Monkeys here and there, birds warbling, gorgeous plumaged birds on the wing, paradise itself, the imperial realm of beauty, nothing to wish for to make it perfect. But it was beyond the isthmus that the voyage loomed into proportions somber and terrible. The vessel they took there, the San Francisco, sailed from Greytown January 1, 1867, the beginning of a memorable year in Mark Twain's life. Next day two cases of Asiatic cholera were reported in the steerage. There had been a rumor of it in Nicaragua, but no one expected it on the ship. The nature of the disease was not hinted at until evening, when one of the men died. Soon after midnight the other followed. A minister making the voyage home, Rev. J. G. Fackler, read the burial service. The gaiety of the passengers, who had become well acquainted during the Pacific voyage, was subdued. When the word cholera went among them, faces grew grave and frightened. On the morning of January 4th, Rev. Fackler's services were again required. The dead man was put overboard within half an hour after he had ceased to breathe. Gloom settled upon the ship. All steam was made to put into Key West. Then some of the machinery gave way, and the ship lay rolling, helplessly becalmed in the fierce heat of the gulf, while repairs were being made. The work was done at a disadvantage, and the parts did not hold. Time and again they were obliged to lie to, in the deadly tropic heat, listening to the hopeless hammering, wondering who would be the next to be sewed up hastily in a blanket and slipped over the ship's side. On the fifth, seven new cases of illness were reported. One of the crew, a man called Shape, was said to be dying. A few hours later he was dead. By this time the Reverend Fackler himself had been taken. So they are burying poor Shape without benefit of clergy, says the notebook. General consternation now began to prevail. Then it was learned that the ship's doctor had run out of medicines. The passengers became demoralized. They believed their vessel was to become a charnel ship. Strict sanitary orders were issued, and a hospital was improvised. Verily, the ship is becoming a floating hospital herself. Not an hour passes, but brings its fresh sensation, its new disaster, its melancholy tidings. When I think of poor shape and the preacher, both so well, when I saw them yesterday evening, I realize that I, myself, may be dead tomorrow. Since the last two hours all laughter, all levity, has ceased on the ship. A settled gloom is upon the faces of the passengers. By noon it was evident that the minister could not survive. He died at two o'clock next morning, the fifth victim in less than five days. The machinery continued to break and the vessel to drag. The ship's doctor confessed to Clemens that he was helpless. There were eight patients in the hospital. But on January 6th they managed to make Key West, and for some reason were not quarantined. Twenty-one passengers immediately deserted the ship and were heard of no more. I am glad they are gone, damn them, says the notebook. Apparently he had never considered leaving, and a number of others remained. The doctor restocked his medicine locker, and the next day they put to sea again. Certainly they were a daring lot of passengers. On the eighth another of the patients died. Then the cooler weather seemed to check the contagion, and it was not until the night of the eleventh, when the New York harbor lights were in view, that the final death occurred. There were no new cases by this time, and the other patients were convalescent. A certificate was made out that the last man had died of dropsy. There would seem to have been no serious difficulty in docking the vessel and landing the passengers. The matter would probably be handled differently today. 
End of chapter 56. Back to the States. Read by John Greenman.